This is Business Edge on New Central. I'm Tony Lokwe at Dileru Balogun. Our headline story, Tourism in Africa after COVID-19. Africa's tourism industry has been heavily impacted by the pandemic as people's economic lives were brought to a standstill and their freedom of movement curtailed. Chiefly among these impacts on African economies is the reduction in foreign income. However, some countries are making concerted efforts to bring back tourists, but this is dependent on many factors. How can countries that make money from tourism find their way back? Welcome. This is Business Edge. With the closure of countries' borders and thus the world economy, intercontinental as well as intracontinental tourist inflows into heavily dependent African tourist countries ceased. Countries such as South Africa, Gambia, Morocco, Kenya, Egypt, and a host of others that are heavily dependent on the expenditure of international tourists witnessed dwindling injections of tourism-based foreign income. Egypt's tourism sector, which accounts for approximately 12% of the country's economy, has experienced a slump in tourism since the onset of the coronavirus pandemic. But the government is making efforts to revive the tourism sector in the country. Tourism is an important economic sector for many countries in Africa. There are many countries that benefit from tourism, like Algeria, Ghana, Kenya, Morocco, South Africa, Tanzania, Tunisia, Uganda, and Egypt. The touristic peculiarity of Africa lies in the wide variety of points of interest, diversity, and the multitude of landscapes as well as the rich cultural heritage of our continent. Sub-Saharan Africa's services-led economic growth has been under increasing strain due to COVID-19. Beyond the threats to health and livelihoods, the pandemic has thrown a wrench into some of the most promising sectors for economic growth in the region. Tourism decline in the face of this unprecedented global pandemic may tell a cautionary tale for tourism-dependent economies both in Africa and the diaspora. Indeed, under COVID-19, the economic outlook is particularly uncertain for African countries with contact-invasive sectors such as tourism, hospitality, entertainment, and transportation. With over 10,000 deaths from the pandemic and almost 180,000 reported cases of COVID-19, tourism revenues in Egypt fell nearly 68% in 2020. In 2019, the country's tourism sector contributed $30.6 billion to the overall gross domestic product. At the peak of this lockdown, the United Nations World Tourism Organization found that 100% of global destinations had either closed their borders to tourists completely or introduced strict measures such as compulsory quarantine for new arrivals. Joining me on the show is Adida Molaidowu. He's the managing partner of Yarajo Travels and Tours, one of Nigeria's leading travel and tour companies. Damola, good morning and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Good morning, Tolu. How are you today? It's good to see you. All right, so let's get straight into it. Now, tourism has had it rough since COVID-19 hit. Uh, take us through how the sector and subsectors that are um, basically associated and connected to tourism, how they've been affected by the pandemic. Um, it's been a very, very uh, disastrous, uh, what's it called, uh, business environment for uh, the tourism and hospitality sector. Of course, because of um, the pandemic itself, um, what has happened is um, businesses have recorded very, very low patronage because uh, people are either stuck at home mm -hmm. or they are very mindful of uh, the places they go to. So um, it's not been very good for the uh, tourism and hospitality sector in general. Okay. So you are a tour operator. And traditionally, <laughs> let's say from 2018, 2019, you go on how many tours a year? Um, how many customers do you service? How many countries do you travel through? Let's use some of your personal experience. So um, before the pandemic, um, we had an average of um, 12 international tours per year, meaning we do uh, one tour to um, a country every year. So, uh, but then uh, on each of those tours, we have um, an average of uh, about maybe 25 to 30 people. Uh, that will take on tours and those are just group tours mm -hmm. those are um that that's outside um services to uh those who are going for honeymoon of course which is private families that want to go on vacation um maybe new couples that want to probably just do the vacation thing 
So, um, which is of course, um, so the group tour is actually just a fraction of what we do. And on the average, um, in a year, we go to about 12 countries with, uh, with um, an average of between 25 to 30 people. And that has definitely been affected. So let's look at a country like Egypt, where uh, for them, tourism is such a major part of their gross domestic product. Now, we're seeing that Egypt is making some moves to revitalize her tourism sector. Some time ago, a restoration project was announced. Um, and that was, of course, looking at new possible tourist sites for tourists to visit. Also, international promotions have been embarked on as well. Do you think if Egypt continues down this line, they will have the desired effect or the desired impact in terms of building up their numbers back? Of course. Um, well, I totally love what Egypt has started. Uh, it signifies something. Tourism is not just the fun that people see. Tourism is fantastic business. Mm. What they have done is to ensure that, uh, oh, this um, revenue stream, even though it was um, hugely affected by the pandemic, they, you know, they come together to put down ways on um, at, at which they can actually revitalize and ensure that they, be, they continue to make money from it. So um, that highlights the fact that, number one, tourism is a serious business, of course, taken um, upon themselves by uh, very serious uh, countries. So what they have done, it's um, very, very commendable. It makes a lot of sense because uh, they know that it's a very, very important revenue stream for them. So what are the things they need to do for people to begin to, you know, you know, um, the, for people to get that confidence to be able to come again? Of course, they need to offer a lot of incentive, like uh, reduced price in hotels, flights and all of those. And so it's actually a right step um, in the right direction for uh, the uh, resurgence of tourism in Egypt, which is a very laudable. Okay, so you talked about the right steps. Let's talk about Rwanda now that has taken an interesting step as well, and that's linking their tourism to sports. We've seen that sports has been an interesting avenue for promoting tourism. We see a number of countries um, bid for Olympic Games, for international competitions because of the influx uh, of tourists and the money that comes with it. But we also saw particularly with Rwanda, what they did with Arsenal in England and um, the Jersey, you see it all the time. Egypt's hosting of the 27th edition of the 2021 Men's World Handball Championship in January was also used as a means of advertising what Egypt has to offer. So before I ask you about how that might play out, right now in 2021 with vaccines rolling out, are tourists ready to bite? Are they also themselves ready to get back into the air and start traveling again? So, um, with regards to Rwanda, they've been doing this for quite some time now, mm. which is also very commendable. What I see that they are doing is brand awareness, at least create the awareness that Rwanda, number one, Rwanda is a country. Rwanda is a country that is safe. Rwanda is a country that is welcoming. Um, I think they were about uh, one of the very first set of people to, to um, actualize their visa on arrival. So, again, that is a country that is deliberate. When I mean very deliberate about tourism, they know how much um, comes in from uh, when people visit. And it is, um, the, the ripple effect is there. It is very practical. If I go to um, a new country, for example, I go to Rwanda. The moment I arrive at the airport, you know, um, I probably take a, a, an airport taxi or I take a local taxi. Mm -hmm. I pay money to um, the local taxi or the airport taxi or whatever. He gets money to be able to also spend, maybe to feed his family, to send his children to school. I get to the hotel. The hotel I'm going to stay, I pay money to them. In turn, they buy toiletries, um, they pay people who wash the bed sheets, they are able to pay their staff. So that is bringing money into their local economy, which has a ripple effect. Money continues to exchange hands, they continue to spend money. So it's, um, I, I don't know, any country that is not looking at tourism, they, they obviously have themselves to blame. So um, with um, regards to Egypt, they are beginning to, uh, you know, offer incentive, which I think makes a lot of sense because, um, yeah, vaccines are beginning to come out. Mm -hmm. How do you, um, you, you how do you repose confidence in your tourists yeah. to let them know um, that you are you are open for business again? You need to be very deliberate about it. You need to offer them incentive, which is actually very important. It's like the same thing that happens in Dubai in uh, uh, what's it called during summer. Dubai is usually very hot. Uh, the temperature rises to about 38, 39, 40 degrees during summer. So around that time, people do not like to go to Dubai at all. But what do they do? What have they done to ensure that people come? 
you see five star hotels going for maybe about 40 50 60 dollars mm. just for people to be able to come get that fantastic experience for very cheap even though the weather is going to be very hot so those are some of the incentives that countries are beginning to devise look at egypt egypt has said oh you land in cairo you are going to other parts as a tourist you're going to other parts of mm. uh, what's it called um the country there is a reduced amount that you pay on your ticket it becomes cheaper for citizens <clears throat> some of their uh, destinations over there as a citizen <clears throat> there's an incentive for you to visit meaning you don't get to pay what other international tourists pay mm. that is also encouraging local tourism so all of these incentives must come in for people to regain that confidence that uh, tourism is back and people are ready to travel again okay so you've talked about these incentives you talked about how intentional it seems egypt is what <coughs> happens to the intentionality of the rest of the countries on the continent that have tourist potential or that do have some form uh, of a tourist economy now so we're seeing egypt being very intentional about getting their numbers back um it is the number one pop it's the number one destination on the continent it's followed by south africa with 10.47 million arrivals in 2018 2019 and south africa is second only to egypt in tourism receipts so what about the intentionality of these other countries? Are they not learning from what Egypt has been doing and what Egypt is doing now? So um, I, I think Africa must, uh, must come to the drawing board to chart um, a course that will take them forward. Interestingly, uh, when it comes to uh, tourism arrival, you understand, um, Africa is uh, the, I think the second, Africa received the second um, largest of international tourists i mean the uh, the numbers mm. you understand so that signifies that yeah we have the second highest number of international um um arrival right. that's per continent they go to a certain number of countries obviously the rest of africa is probably sleeping mm. and um the earlier we begin to um, market our tourism the earlier we begin to um you know uh, get intentional about our tourism i think uh, the better for us nigeria for example nigeria is always an, an, an example of how uh, tourism has been neglected nigeria is supposed to take you know the forefront um in um, ensuring that tourism um is you know we're, we're just fixated on oil first and foremost um i do not think for me, we do not have a minister, um, a ministry of tourism in Nigeria, mm. which is actually, you know, it's um, it's very appalling. You don't make um, some information culture. It's not even. It's it's really appalling. You understand? So Nigeria is an example of a country that has failed when it comes to tourism. Mm. We're not taking our destination seriously at all. Um, the business climate is very rough um, because uh, people do not have confidence that um, if they bring in their money what would happen maybe in about one two three four years about maybe there's a change of government and all of those things yeah. so africa um africa needs to come together yeah this thing is um it's a money spinner you understand it is getting it's it's very practical people bringing money into your economy i've explained the ripple effects yeah money yeah. continues to exchange and and your local economy gains and benefits a lot from this thing so if um egypt um south africa morocco and the rest of rwanda and the rest of them continue to do very well i'm just very hopeful well i am i'm only hopeful that the rest of africa can actually begin to look up to them to say no these guys do not have two heads uh, these mm -hmm. guys have opened their borders these guys have uh, provided incentives you know and of course safety is also very important yes, you know security. if you put all of these elements together you understand it encourages people to come and I can only hope that um, Nigeria takes um, the lead maybe um, okay. in a few months or years to come. All right, so we're going to go on a quick break, but I want to leave our viewers with some numbers, and that is the potential for tourism on the continent to also help Africa deal with unemployment. There are many analysts that believe that African nations can actually curb unemployment with tourism. And here are some of the numbers. Tourism employs more than a million people each in the following countries, Nigeria. Ethiopia, South Africa, Kenya, and Tanzania. More than a million people in each of these countries. And more than 20% of total employment in Seychelles, Cape Verde, 
Satome and Principe and Mauritius. Let's think about those numbers as we go on this break. When we come back, the conversation continues. Tourism in Africa after COVID-19. Stay with us. With reports that Africa's tourism sector could lose close to 50 or has lost about $50 billion because of the coronavirus, we are seeing how we can move forward. My guest is Adida Mola Idowu. He is the managing partner and CEO of Iranjo Travels and Tours. So Damola, let's talk about vaccines because for African tourism to come back, uh, to take back some of the numbers that it's lost, there are factors outside of our control. And some of those factors, of course, involve international air travel, which is going to be heavily dependent on people being vaccinated. So we're seeing vaccines come into play. And with it, the International Air Transport Association's Travel Pass Initiative. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Travel Pass Initiative is to inform passengers on what tests, vaccines, and other measures they require prior to travel details on where they can get tested and gives the passengers the ability to share their test and vaccination results in a verifiable, safe and privacy protecting manner. So this is something that the International Air Transport Association is putting together because their members have been hit and they've watched countries also suffer. What do you think of this initiative? And when, I don't want to say if, and when it takes off, what do you think of its ability to help spur international air travel, uh, which is a very large part of tourism for the African continent, um, back to some some good numbers? Um, I think it's a very good initiative, but I'm not very sure of um, how that is going to play out. Um, if that's going to mean that I have to get vaccinated before I jump on um, a flight to another country, or if, it, if that's going to be a prerequisite for me to be admitted, admitted into another country, mm. um, I don't know that's, um, how that's going to play out, uh, of course, because of... Um, when Nigeria and um, you know countries like Ghana, Ivory Coast, and I can't maybe about maybe South Africa, I think, are taking delivery of uh, about the first set of um, vaccination doses. Um, unfortunately, um, you know I, I think we're the most populous nation uh, on the continent, and um, not a single dose um, has been administered or even taken delivery of. So they, they um, should yeah. arrive, but just an update: the doses are supposed to arrive in the country tomorrow, according to the head of the presidential uh, task force for COVID-19. Okay, so we can only keep our fingers crossed yes. to see, um, how, um, you know, um, just, um, I, I don't know what, I, I think I read somewhere maybe about uh, 4 million, you know, um, we're, we're just about um, 200 million. And um, let's see how that is going to play out. But then for um, international air travel, um, I think the initiative makes sense. Um, of course, it ensures that, um, uh, the, the coronavirus or whatever uh, disease or whatever, it's not transmitted from one country to another. Mm -hmm. But then um, there are countries that are poor. Are okay, some, um, some technical issues there. But getting into a conversation about the IATA's Travel Pass Initiative. Uh, Damola, are you back with us? Oh, yes, I am. Okay, so you were mentioning about uh, poorer countries and how this may not necessarily work in their favor. Can you continue? Yeah, yes. So, um, well, um, according to uh, WTO, um, I, I think one of uh, the, uh, what's it called, the very, very, um, um, do I say, first assignment of uh, Dr. Priorities. Yeah. yeah, it's uh, to ensure that, of course, um, poorer countries also have access so in this regard, I think uh, it may be a fantastic initiative as long as um, the vaccines are equally and, um, you know, you know, equally distributed. Mm. So that would ensure that um, people who want to move from one country to another have, the, have access to that vaccine so that um, they don't, you know, get to another country to you. So I, I think it's fantastic. But then we need to just watch how that is going to play out. OK. Uh, let's come back to a country such as Nigeria, and um, it is a low tourism inflow country. We do have tourists, but given the natural wonders that are in Nigeria, as many countries, it should be better. What would you do? What would you say in terms of suggestions for Nigeria to attract more visitors for not even just Nigeria, but to, uh, countries that don't have the numbers that Egypt, Morocco, South Africa come in? Tourism is a very competitive, very, very competitive sector. And some people will like to go to the same place over and over again because they've never finished visiting or never seen all the sites completely. And some are looking to try something new all the time. But for those who are still not in the top five, in the top 10, 
how do we surmount those challenges? What do we need to address first? So um, we have a couple of things we need to talk about as a nation uh, with regards to tourism. Um, do people actually come to Nigeria for tourism? No. But do people actually come to Nigeria? A lot of people come to Nigeria. I can't even count the number of airlines that touch down Lagos, Ibano, Port Harcourt every day and almost every hour. So this means that the people who come to Nigeria, what do they actually come for? Um, why is it that they do not visit our attractions and will record these numbers? So um, those are some of the questions we need to ask ourselves. On the um, other hand, um, I think um, some of the challenges why uh, we don't have uh, very high numbers when it comes to um, international tourist arrivals is uh, because of the state of our tourism. It is a uh, this is a um, this has been putting it mildly. It is um, very appalling, mm. and um, the business climate for tourism, the business climate in Nigeria is almost nothing to write home about. Imagine I go to um, I invest in a destination. And maybe a year or two after a new government comes in and, uh, and they, they, they just kick you out, you understand? Mm -hmm. So that's not even encouraging at all. Look at the security challenges the, current, the country is currently facing. It's, um, it's nothing to write them about. I wouldn't want to go to a country where um, I won't be able to even leave my hotel room mm. because of maybe kidnapping, you know, and all of those things police brutality and, and the rest of them. So um, we need to, uh, we need to talk about these things. Um, I read on, on social media, a Nigerian who came uh, all the way from America sometime, they had December last year, he talked about, he shared his experience about, um, experience of police brutality. Yeah. Just yeah, because, um, you know, uh, they found maybe, I can't remember in his they wallet. They found a certificate for guns. Uh, he was a licensed he, uh, gun yeah, player, he's, yes. he's, yeah, not even the gun itself, you yeah. understand? So, we, we need to, um, you know, have this conversation because People need to have that confidence. I am going to Nigeria. I won't be harassed. Okay. I am going to Nigeria. I won't be kidnapped. I am going to Nigeria. I will spend my money at this destination and I will get good value for money. All right. Government needs to know that they have to end solve tourism. It has to be like um, a, a partnership between government and the private sector. And the private sector has to drive it, mm -hmm. not even government itself. All right, um, Adidamola, we'll leave the conversation here today. There's more to talk about. We've seen bailouts for different sectors across the continent, uh, even for the aviation sector, which is largely linked to the tourism sector, but not so much of bailouts happening specifically for uh, the tourism sector. We also have the conversation around the policies and the key policy priorities that African governments need to look at. But time is not with us. We will continue this conversation at a later dates. Adidamola, Idowu, thank you so much for joining me on Business Edge. Thank you so much for having me. All right, fantastic. And you know what we do now as we wrap things up, we get you a few stories we're keeping our eyes on. We start in Northern, Night, Northern Africa, where Morocco's Minister of Energy, Mines and Environment, Aziz Rabah, has reaffirmed Morocco's commitment to Africa's green recovery following the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, Morocco will implement these projects as part of the national strategy for a sustainable development. The new programs include environmental observation, monitoring, control, protection, and enhancement. They also include pollution control, as well as the ambitious national climate policy of 44.2% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030. A new minimum wage of 21.68 rand per hour starting today in South Africa. Now, Employment and Labor Minister announced that the national minimum wage for each ordinary hour worked will, as of March 2021, increase from 20.76 uh, to 21.69 rand back in February. To be precise, that is, of course, the 10th of February. The Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria Limited has joined the Nigerian government's goal of using the country's proven gas reserves to increase economic activities for gas-based industrialization of the country. Now, SPDC's managing director and country chairman of Shell Companies in Nigeria, Osage Okumbo, said that while well, said this while speaking at the Nat Nigerian Gas Association's 12th International Conference and Awards. And finally, the consortium of Carbis. Carbicide Investments PLC and Aksaya Investments LLP have opened a 30-day offer period to acquire shares 
enlisted BOC Kenya PLC for 1.2 billion Kenyan shillings. Now, according to the offer, they placed a joint bid to acquire up to 100% of the issued share capital of BOC Kenya and have secured the support of the company's majority shareholder, that's the UK-based BOC Holdings, which holds a 65.38% stake in the supplier of industrial, medical, and special gases firm. That's it on this edition of Business Edge. Don't forget to follow us on social media. We are at New Central TV. We have a website. We're online, offline, and we are on the ground. I'm Tolu Lakwe, Adila Rubalogo. I'll see you next time.